Hey y'all, quick note. While My Hero Academia was created for kids, this podcast is not safe for work or children. All trigger warnings and spoilers for each episode can be found at our website, myheroanalysis.com. Thanks for listening. Hey y'all, this is My Hero Analysis, a podcast about My Hero Academia, aka Boku no Hero Academia. We are three grown adults who mine Japanese children's cartoons for serotonin because God knows our brains are not making it naturally. Hello, everyone. Uh, This is your host whose name keeps changing because I haven't decided on one yet. Although Fern went over very well last week. I was I was vibing with it. I liked it a lot, but I'm still going to choose some more just to make sure. So I think today let's do bud and see how that goes. Okay. But first, is it one D or two? Um, just one, I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Well, I'm still Nicole. This week was pretty boring. I can hear clicky clacks in the background. Yeah. It's pickles. She's sniffing my costumes, ma'am. <laughs> Hi pickles. Yeah. I love you. You're a good girl. Um, the highlight of this week was I finally found <laughs> an electric heater that looks like a, like a fireplace. Yes. So now my library is that much more aesthetic. And I've been very annoying about it in the group chat. <laughs> it looks beautiful. Oh my God, I love it. Hey y'all, it's Maria. I did not see any of the group chat because I've been dying all week. <laughs> Poor baby Poor sick. Thing. Yeah, I uh, I got a cold after like two years of not having one and I don't know how to deal. So um, <laughs> if you hear my voice being all stuffed up, I think this is the second week in a row where my where my voice is not the normal voice. So I apologize. I yeah. swear I did not ask for this. I really hate being sick. <laughs> and no, it's not COVID. We checked. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, it's not COVID. We are responsible like that. And we also record not in the same location. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. like an hour that's, away from both of you. <laughs> yeah, you are far, far away, and I'm about to be even farther. But it's fine. <laughs> I'm sad. Kind of sad. Yeah. Aww. Anyway. <laughs> that just got real sad. Yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna move right past that. So this week we're covering episode 10 of the anime Encounter with the Unknown and the accompanying manga chapters, which this week are chapters 14 and 15. Um, and then we haven't really been discussing the little preview window image that pops up when it's like, do you want to play this title? And you know, you see that little preview image. Um, but this week I wanted to mention that it is Shoto and his little, his sleepy little blank face. He looks very adorable and also very done. Um, and I thought it was cute. Yeah. And I, I had no idea what Bud was talking about. Um, <laughs> and I do want to point out, I watch it on Hulu and I think they watch it, what, on Crunchyroll or something? Yeah. yeah. So Yeah. So the preview boxes are actually different. So I don't think it was Shoto. <gasps> Oh, damn. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't choose it. <laughs> they do show up, but you you have to go look at the actual, like, episode, episode. Yeah. Uh, and in the in Hulu, because I watch it on Hulu. I watch it at Mambo. Sometimes I switch from Hulu to Crunchyroll and vice versa, because Crunchyroll is a bitch sometimes. Yeah, Crunchyroll can be kind of difficult, but I'm paying for it, and it's like the only streaming subscription that I'm paying for. So (laughs) So you feel like you have to use it? Yes, exactly. I feel that. Oh, I pay for all of that, all of them. Uh, I'm my family's sugar mama, daddy. (laughs) Same, Uh, same, yep. Yeah, I'm definitely unintentionally leading into that sugar baby status. (laughs) You deserve it. (laughs) Um, But anyway... This episode is what begins the infamous USJ arc that we've mentioned like 40 different times in this <laughs> podcast and we told you to wait for it. Yeah, this is it. Uh, we're not prepared, but we're just going to dive right in anyway. Uh, so this episode also opens with the beginning credits right away. Yeah, I'm frightened. I'm mm. not ready. I'm worried. I, I did not skip the end of this <laughs> 
you watched it all the way through? I did. Well, I just vibed. I really didn't watch. <laughs> but I vibed. <laughs> It's just, oh God, it's so good. I'm going to be sad when it changes. Although the new ones are, they're all wonderful, but I do really like this one. Uh, And so when the episode starts, we do get a bit of a repeat of the scene where Kiri is confused where all the villains are showing up and he's like, is this, is this part of the test? But then Aizawa has his, his little ominous, those are villains line. Um, and we really didn't discuss it last time, but um, Kirishima also mentions uh, the entrance exam and how there was no starting countdown. So as Mike predicted, real life incidents come with no warning. <laughs> yeah, th- this was not in the dub. So there was just no connection to previous episodes. They're all just frightened. That's much like myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then as Nol- uh, Nicole predicted this time. Kurogiri gets his line and he mentions that they quote unquote received a teacher schedule during the incident with the press yesterday and that they know All Might was supposed to be here. Yeah. And in the dub, the dialogue is a little different. Um, Aizawa actually says, so you used the press as a cover when you sneaked onto campus. So I know it should be snuck, but grammar is weird. And see, when I watch that, just like picking out that very specific line, you can argue that it's not evidence of there being a traitor. It's just evidence of somebody being sneaky, but we will get to it. Yeah, I I agree. The phrasing is really unclear. Horikoshi, could you please quit toying with us? <laughs> he will never stop toying with us. I know. Nope, never. <laughs> it, is, it is his one joy in life as he is exhausted from creating this. <laughs> Yeah, I'm exhausted from watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just, he was like, if I have to suffer, so does everybody else. And then also, <laughs> I thought at first that this line that um, Shiggy says, or Kurogiri, Kurogiri, sorry, that Kurogiri says uh, was addressed to Aizawa and 13 specifically. Um, but then a little later on, I had to rewind because I was getting confused. And I realized that he's only talking to Shigaraki. So I guess like the kids and Aizawa and 13 didn't hear any of that because they appeared very confused in like a couple of minutes. Interesting. Yeah. I do like that he's letting the audience know more than Mm -hmm. the characters. It's very good storytelling. Yeah. Um, The scene also gives us a lot of information like right off the bat, including Mm -hmm. that the villains are here specifically for All Might. And of course, like Nicole mentioned, the schedule they received how did they get it, I wonder? We fucking wonder, and we're going to keep fucking wondering. Yeah, we're still wondering. <laughs> hundreds of chapters later. <laughs> Literally hundreds of chapters later. So now, Shigaraki, uh, who's the hand guy? We called him hand guy, but like, we, we know his name. We're just going to stop pretending that we don't. It's Shigaraki. We call him Shiggy. So Shiggy is all like, God damn it. I went to all this trouble and All Might's not even here. Like he's some white suburban mom whose husband forgot about date night again. So he decides to go ahead and attack the students in order to lure All Might out. And then (laughs) as we were doing this timeline, it became very, very apparent that we needed to pause thirst break number one. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, while Shiggy has his Karen moment, um, (laughs) he basically says, maybe I'll kill a few kids and they'll come out to play. And Aizawa's hair and scarf activate like Mm -hmm. his frick, like his hackles are going up again, much like a cat. Um, But it was so fucking sexy. I'm not even sorry. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I paused right as Aizawa was doing the thing where he's releasing his scarf and it was just so fucking hot. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't. Oh my goodness. Um, Also, I cannot with you, bud. (laughs) This is exactly how Shiggy sounds. Like, he is done with everything and the climax hasn't even started. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) He's so impatient. He's... Early Shiggy is very much uh, spoiled toddler or at least that's how he comes off and things get more complicated later but yeah 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 right now he's kind of annoying (laughs) kind of (laughs) i would argue that he stays annoying but i don't want the shiggy stands coming for my neck so (laughs) they're scary i should mention i should mention okay so like shigaraki kind of repulsive to me i'm not gonna lie that being said that being said shigaraki cosplayers (laughs) He 
keep it up. <laughs> y'all, uh, y'all all have to be like the most beautiful people on the planet if you're making this guy look like a model. So I'm very impressed is all I'm saying. Yeah, I feel like it's partly their fault that so many people are thirsty for sugar. <laughs> it absolutely is. <laughs> I do not understand the thirst, but y'all do you. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's something else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's we'll something. That on my microphone. <laughs> I just, I, I cannot, I, I cannot. <laughs> well, I love it. I can barely can with myself. Like I cannot. <laughs> Oh God. Okay. So moving on from that little detour, I took us down. Uh, so then we get a shot of Izuku's absolutely fucking terrified face. And then we get the faces of the other villains, which I kind of interpreted as Horikoshi, like giving us an indication of who are going to be the key players going forward. So you've got Kurogiri, who's the purple fog guy, and then the giant bird brain person whose name we still don't have yet, but it's coming up soon. And then of course, Shigaraki. Uh, and this is all overlaid by future Izuku's narration talking about like, quote unquote, extraordinary evil. It's very spooky. It's very ominous. So like playtime is officially fucking over. Yeah, it is. And in the dub, he's basically saying that the villains are pure evil staring up at the students. And like, this is definitely a little reductive. Um, <laughs> yeah, but at it, least half of them were just there because they were getting paid. And like, yeah. fair. Uh, yeah, paid or basically just getting a shot at the symbol of peace where mm-hmm. they might not be able to get it otherwise. Uh, but it's okay, Izuku. You you are a small child. You will learn the complexities soon enough. Oh, boy. Lord. Yeah, Izuku <laughs> looks so terrified. Poor Bibi. He can't... <clears throat> you could tell that he's going to have a tough battle by how the music speeds up. Mm. And Suzuku making you feel anxious at what is to come next. Not like we weren't already anxious before, but you know. Oh yeah. As per usual, the music adds to it. Yep. Just cranks everything so much higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the kids are all like, wait, how the fuck did they get in? Like there are sensors, there's all this like preventative stuff set up like this isn't supposed to happen very easily and so they kind of work together with 13 to figure out that a one of the villains must have a quirk that's suppressing the sensors and b they're possibly also suppressing all outside communication so like these are some smart babies they got here like this was some good teamwork Mm -hmm. yeah it's impressive that they could analyze this much in the situation it also shows that these babies are impressive in their own right. Mm, absolutely. And then our sweet boy Shoto gets a bit of a spotlight moment as he puts together what was probably the villain's plan. So like USJ, uh, as Nicole mentioned last week, I was incorrect. USJ is technically on campus, but it's like in an isolated part of campus. Mm-hmm. Um, so Shiggy and his crew had to wait till the class was there. So, you know, there was some planning behind this. There's clearly some kind of end goal. Um, And this was the part where I got confused because I was like, they just told you like why they were there. You don't, you don't have to put this together. And so I had to rewind and I was like, oh, they weren't talking to the teachers and the students at all. They were just talking to each other, but it was unclear because animation. Yeah. Yeah. It it was definitely a little unclear. Um, I just thought of it as they were being pretty far away that they probably couldn't hear it but anyway uh, <laughs> Sho- Sho- Shoto like calls them dumb but not too dumb but... and I feel like he's either purposefully or accidentally drawing a parallel between them and Bakugo and I wonder if that was purposeful in the storytelling but who knows yeah that's a good point yeah Shoto <laughs> yeah he's really good at calling peeps out I love mm. him so much um you can tell he's good at analyzing an opponent maybe not as good as Deku but he's got there. he's got more experience behind him than the other kids and it shows and there's reasons for that yes uh for so very then, sad reasons oh boy well, well as we're it. very fond of well, saying I will have a lot to say that episode <laughs> a lot of fighting words will be said Oh, yeah. Yes, honey. Absolutely. We will roll out the red carpet. We will set up your stage. 
but yeah so where the fuck are we okay here we go (laughs) so then aizawa tells 13 to start evacuating the kiddos and to try calling the school so that they can test out the kids theory and he also ropes in kaminari which was kind of confusing um but then you know good job listening to your kiddos aizawa like they came up with a theory and he was like okay let's test it yeah um i'm still a little confused as to why aizawa asks Kaminari to use his quirk to try to try to contact the school um and I don't think that's actually something that ever comes into play again yeah. uh because as we know just from watching forward in the show we know that Kaminari's quirk is kind of like it's electrification which is basically just lightning manipulation so that communication aspect of his quirk is never like used again or yeah as they never as try to remember. use it again um, I think we'll get more into it at the bottom of the episode, um, but it's, it's just interesting that as I thought he could do that. Yeah, it would make sense that Kaminari's quirk to be Kaminari's quirk to be used to contact the school um, if he can find like the specific wavelength. So electricity works with a vibration of electrons, and they essentially work like a like waves. So a certain frequency could be used to transmit to be transmitted via the signal. Electricity causes frictions between the waves and frequencies. So if it's matched up perfectly, it can actually create a sound and or a signal. Also, electricity can be conducted in the ground by bouncing off from mineral to mineral. Um, And this has been Maria's science corner of today. Okay, so could he potentially do like a kind of Morse code SOS situation? Yes, definitely. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot more sense than what I was thinking, how he was basically using his quirk as a radio microphone. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, the SOS thing, that makes a lot more sense. At least at his skill level right now. Oh yeah. He's not very um, subtle or flexible with his quirk at the moment. Yeah. I mean, they've all got a long way to go. Yeah. And then sweet baby Izuku is all like, Aizawa, are you going to be okay? This isn't how you usually fight. And then Aizawa has his, and this I put it in a, like capitalization, the line. Yeah. Yes. It's a very <laughs> special line that basically is his thing throughout the show. Um, Izuka lays out like Eraserhead's own MO uh-huh. and like how he works from analyzing him. <laughs> um, and basically Izuku says that he's best at stealth fights, not like brawls out in the open. And then Aizawa's line is you can't be a pro hero if you only have one trick. And this like shocks Izuku and probably teaches him more of a lesson Mm. than like 10 quirk training lessons could have. Yes. Yeah. um, And this line becomes so important in pushing not just Izuku, but also the all the other munchkins. It was Mm. such a powerful line because, I mean, we can see it in future with Ochako. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Ochako, Katsuki, yeah. Arguably, um, all of them, really. they all take that yep. to heart and mm-hmm. like diversify their techniques eventually. Absolutely, one hundred percent. And now we're gonna pause for thirst break number two. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Uh, because if if you didn't fall in love with Eraserhead in this scene, you are incapable of romantic love, which is also fine. We love our full on a romantics, but also, are you sure you watched him carefully enough? <laughs> I feel like I can say this because I'm on the arrow spectrum. It's fine. I am in love with a fictional man. Also, instead of like you know running down the stairs like a normal person does um mm-hmm. he he takes a flying leap and just sexually flies down the staircase um i know this is a very serious moment but come on have you watched that <laughs> oh my god just Isola leaping straight into battle was so fucking attractive like what the fuck he is ready to fight and i am here for it yeah yeah like thinking back to like when i first watched the show and he did his leap i didn't think about it as being ridiculous i thought oh my god this man is flying thank god (laughs) (laughs) yeah i saw it he definitely absolutely leaps into action looks like a motherfucking boss 
And the villains are all like, fuck yeah, let's do this. Let's fight. But then they're also like, who the fuck is this guy? He wasn't supposed to be here. Um, <laughs> we're going to come back to that point in a second because we need to take Thirst Break number three. <laughs> yeah. The I think was so menacing and so hot. <laughs> I know. So basically what's happening here is his, he first takes out the shooter squad um, with his quirk, essentially nullifying long range attacks right off the bat. And then he swings them through the air like they're made of cardboard. Like it looked like they were like, what, 20, 30 feet up in the air? Sure. Would you say? Yeah. <laughs> He's, he's just heckin' strong. Um, <laughs> I, I don't remember writing this line, but apparently I wrote the lyrics, you spin me right round, baby, right round. I did not remember that, but it is true because he's just he's just twirling all the villains and just dispatching them in one shot. It's beautiful. And then he just mashes them together like the king he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, it's like, what, two moves and he's taken out four people. It's beautiful. Oh, he did amazing. I love also, it. thank you to Nicole for breaking down the fight scenes. Because every time a fight scene happens, my brain is just like, oh, God, things are happening. So many things. Oh, goodness. And like, I get excited, but I also get completely overwhelmed. So I was absolutely not going to break those down. So thank you for doing that. I am always happy to break them down. It's um, the ADHD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. And then going back to the whole, like, you know, the villains have no idea who Aizawa is. Like, Okay, clearly they got some intel and they did some planning, but like, what kind of shit ass intel? Like, this is <laughs> Aizawa's class. Obviously, he would be with them. So, like, either the traitor is someone who isn't actually all that familiar with like the school and the names of the staff, and they just fucking lucked out on getting like some primo info, or potentially the traitor is also toying with the villains. Yeah, that is exactly what I was thinking too on this specific rewatch. Like there, there's some holes in whatever is going on here. And we are going to talk about it in the season end discussion mm -hmm. because I have a feeling it's going to get pretty spoilery and we don't want to spoil you too much in the middle of the season. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Also, he is also not as known as some of the other teachers. So there is that. But it would would it make sense for the villains not to know this if the traitor had helped? Yeah, like if the traitor was one of the kids or a staff member, they, they'd know I saw his name. <laughs> so yeah, I saw was doing his thing, and suddenly everyone recognizes him, and they quickly figure out that he can't erase heteromorphic type quirks, and that's quirks that change your physical appearance um, or some physical aspect of your body. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Because he's still a better fighter than they are. And his goggles, the way that they're put together with like little slats, so he can see through them, but those slats hide the direction of his gaze as they protect him, you know, from like free floating bullshit in the atmosphere. So actually, he's really well suited to fighting a whole bunch of people at once, especially once you factor in the capture weapon. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, uh, listeners, we took these notes a little while longer ago than usual, so I do not remember, but I just have like a whole block of text. So let's, <laughs> let's just go on this adventure together. Um, we will learn more about the mechanics of Aizawa's quirk later, I believe in season four is when he really so, yeah. breaks it down. But essentially, heteromorphic quirks don't work by like temporary expression of the quirk genes. They're just always on. So there's something about the quirk yeah, there's expression. there's nothing to be turned off, essentially. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, but so <laughs> instead of trying to like erase his quirk, he just punches the guy right in the face. <laughs> um, and he punches in so hard, he also flies like 20 feet into the air. Like, I, how strong is this skinny ass man? Um, <laughs> We'll get to my feelings about Twink Zawa later. Yeah, because he's not a twink. He's just his jumpsuit yeah, is have, very slimming. I'm, I'm I'm upset about that. It's fine. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it. We need to find that fan art and talk about it. Anyway, <laughs> and essentially the fight continues by Aizawa like shooting his capture weapon after him, and while he's reaching for the guy flying through the air, he like ducks from an attack that's coming from behind him. Um, and he kicks that guy back 
sending him into two other villains. And then he slams the heteromorphic guy down onto those three, taking out four more villains in two moves. Like that is primo fighting. And it's just, it's amazing. What do you want to bet that Aizawa like aced all of his math classes? Math? Yeah. Like he seems to have like a very intuitive understanding of physics and geometry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking geometry. I was like, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. He's got this sort of brain that goes step, 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 and then mm-hmm. it all equals a good a good effect. Um, and then as Bud says, his goggles prevents people from knowing who he's looking at, which adds an element of surprise to his attacks and also helps prevent communication and planning by the people he's targeting. So because they don't know who he's going to go after next, that's going to mess with their planning if they have any. (laughs) Also, he's narrating what he's doing (laughs) like the whole time, which on one hand makes no sense, uh, but it is a shounen anime and the the, the narration is just something that happens. Um, But on the other hand, it does make like a good intimidation factor. And basically he's explaining that he's taken measures to make sure heteromorphics like can't reach him because that's when it's dangerous for them to reach you. They can like mm-hmm. touch you. But all this to say is he's just really fucking good in a physical fight, no matter how many people he's fighting, but especially with these one-off primary attacks that are going to prevent a drawn out fight that then would lessen the effectiveness of his quirk when it comes to, you know, needing to blink and shit like that. hmm and like I said a moment before, uh, Shigaraki actually narrates that there he goes trying to intimidate us. Um, yep. <laughs> but also uh, it's working. But also, also again, um, how dare Shigi recognize that at this stage of his character development? Like I'm mad <laughs> that he got something right. How dare? Fuck, there's actual potential there. God damn it. God damn it. <laughs> Why? I hate him. <laughs> the yeah, stands are going to come for me. I have nothing to say to this, but I agree with Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't know why I had to break it down frame by frame, but here we go. You did amazing though. Like that was really, really good. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. I'm very impressed. Also, I need to blow my nose. Hold on one second. (laughs) Yeah. I've been trying not to cough as much. (laughs) Yeah. Do you need to take a quick cough break? Go ahead and take it. No, I'm good. Yeah. Here we thought we'd be pausing for Maria and we're pausing for my crusty ass once again. (laughs) Crusty ass. I just I I turn away from the mic whenever I cough, so I try I try to be as far away from it. You're good. You're good. Um. So yeah, I'm back. No more nose blowing. Maybe you know what? I'm wondering if that's why. Like, part of me wants to empathize with Shiggy, as gross as he is, because I also have crazy allergies and like a fuckload of skin issues. That's not a reason to relate to him. <laughs> You're right. You're right. He's pretty, oh God, he's pretty unrelatable. Um, because I mean, there's such a thing called lotion. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I he's, that. he's not relatable, but he becomes more sympathetic, I think is where a lot of people get it confused. Like you can feel bad for him, but if you relate to him, <laughs> I relate to some things, not yeah. others. It's like some things, but we'll get to it. Yeah, definitely not right now because like while this fight is happening, Shiggy has a sign. He's like, I hate pro heroes. The masses don't stand a chance against them. So like y'all just brace yourselves for a bunch of like pseudo intellectual bullshit that he's not consistent with and definitely doesn't even actually believe. So like if this is your reason for hopping on the bandwagon, uh, I guess off. at some point you jumped off because he completely abandoned. He completely abandons it at some point. Yeah, exactly. He's he's just so goddamn pretentious. Uh, he's a classic incel quasi quasi philosopher, and it's just it's just all bullshit at this stage mm-hmm. of his development. Um, I actually think that it being such bullshit was purposeful, uh, but we will get to it in a little bit. Yep. Incel retweet underlined and bold. I have been trying to figure out how to describe him and this, this is perfection. (laughs) Yeah. Early Shiggy, I think definitely falls under that, under that umbrella. Um, And then now we're going to pause for thirst break number four. (laughs) 
<laughs> there's a lot of thirst breaks. Um, but I mean, even I have to admit, I thought it was pretty hot in this one. So, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. You can't say he's not being hot. Um, uh, basically, this thirst break is actually based on what Shiggy says next. And he says the worst thing about dealing with pros is when they live up to all their height. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> because that's my husband. He is just that good. He is the best. And you can't deny it. You gross little itchy man. Mm-hmm. How dare Shiggy talk like that about our husband? <laughs> also, this came to me in the voice of Molly Weasley when she sent out that howler. <laughs> How dare Shiggy talk? <laughs> Just end it there. Just how dare he talk? <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's, we're going to have to make like a sound bite of that. Anyway. <laughs> um, and then it, it basically cuts to from Shiggy like scratching himself grossly, uh, which it we'll get explained, but right now he's scratching himself and it's really gross. And it like, what is hygiene? He doesn't know. Uh Um, but then it goes right back to Aizawa and we get a nice profile shot of his hair up and then floated gently back down. Um, is it really any wonder why I am in love with this man? (laughs) He is a thing of beauty. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty great. Oh, it's wonderful. And I love that it, it, he's not even meant to be drawn in a way that is any form of attractive. And yet he has captured all of our hearts. Anyway, <laughs> to, to, uh, to get sad about it, um, there's also a split second where Kurugiri squints at Aizawa during his battle. And like, y'all, it, it's going to be a while before we unpack that. But mm-hmm. damn. We're going to talk about it at the bottom of the episode and later, and it's just sad. So just remember that one little frame of the smoke guy squinting because yep. I almost cried. The one that cried. we're going to hold clutched to our chests as we cry over it. <sighs> yeah, I ha- I was going to make the same note. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. We're all, we're all vibing. We're all yep. on the same page. Yeah. Uh, so the kids are evacuating as all of this is going on, but Izuku is lingering because he's analyzing the fight. And I put in the notes, I said, I don't even have words. Maybe they'll come to me later. They didn't. This is just, <laughs> it's. <sighs> yeah, this is classic Azuka wanting to analyze the fight. The only yep. thing stopping him is lack of the, the real MC, the notebook. Yep. 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 And then of course you have Tanya who's like, would you get your dumb ass in gear and leave? Yeah. Yeah. Retweet. Yep. Retweet times two. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, literally everybody else is dashing for the exit, but then Kurogiri stops them. He like does this like weird leap thing and then lands in front of the exit. And so Kurogiri officially introduces the group as the League of Villains and reveals that they're looking for All Might. Um, And he's doing this like weird, formal, polite thing. Um, Kurogiri's definitely got like a very interesting personality. Um, This isn't the last time we're gonna see kind of odd behavior from him, just stay tuned. Yeah, his way of speaking currently is pretty straightforward and like villainous, almost to a cliche. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's referring to UA as a haven for justice, or I mean, something like that. And he reveals that All Might will take his last breath here. Um, it's very monologue ish, but I mean, he can have it because we know <laughs> who he is, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, I do enjoy the way he's speaking. Uh, honestly, his voice, if he wasn't, you know, wanting to kill All Might, is very soothing. At least yes. the Japanese voice actor is. That's the word. That's the word. His voice is very calm and soothing. And like, yeah. you almost yeah, just his- kind of automatically want to trust it. Yeah, his English. Yeah, yeah. he's very charismatic. Yeah, and sort I think of. his English voice actor did like the exact same thing because the words he was saying was ridiculous but (laughs) the way he was saying them you got drawn in yeah he's so sincere too Mm -hmm. right and then next you cut right back to eraser who's narrating in his head now um that he blinked and the most troublesome guy got away Mm -hmm. um i'm assuming he's now too far for his quirk to affect but we don't know the range either and i don't think we ever find out 
But well, he's also still surrounded by people actively trying to kill him. <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, it does seem like he's affecting multiple people per blank. Um, but I don't, don't think we ever get confirmation on how many people he can erase at once. And like, just like Bud said, he's hemmed in and he can't chase after Kurogiri and he can't get back to his kids. Yeah, he really wants to go protect his kids, but everyone is ganging up on him and he can't stop the villains from attacking him. So he, he doesn't have time to put his eye drops in. <laughs> yeah, he is really fucking backed into a corner. So then uh, cut back to the kiddos and 13 goes to attack Kurigiri, but Katsuki and Kirishima beat her to it. And Kirishima's all like, we're going to beat you before you can beat us. Like just all in. That's just the kind of kid he is. Uh, but then Kurogiri like surrounds everyone with like this dome of his fog stuff and then shoots a bunch of them out um, and through like these portals to different parts of the arena. Yeah, exactly. And um, the only thing that Kirishima and Katsuki's attack actually does is reveal some kind of metal apparatus under his glowing eyes, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't actually hurt him that we can tell yeah uh, and 13 does try to go for a counterattack, but the smoke consumes them and he actually says that he's going to scatter them all to their respective deaths i do want to point out that this like dome of smoke and wind really got my like red thread mm. brain going um but again we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it but just remember the wind yeah. Also, can we talk about how Ida immediately took action this time to save two of his classmates and get out of the dome? Mm -hmm. He learned really quickly. Mm -hmm. He did so good there. So we cut to Izuku, who lands in this water area, and he's still doing his analysis thing, even as he's like almost drowning. And he also <laughs> he almost gets attacked by this like shark person, but he's saved by Sue. Fuck yeah. Good job, honey. And she's doing all of that while she's got Mineta tucked under one arm. Hell yeah. Yeah. As Sue goes analyzing, right? It just like takes over, you know? Yeah. I love how much Sue gets the sharky while like villain away while saying sayonara. Mm -hmm. I love her so much. She's really got style. She's so yeah. great. So then um, the show reveals that we've landed in the shipwreck zone. So Sue swims them over to where this little um, model ship is. And she lays Izuku down as gently as she can. But then Mineta makes this gross ass comment. So he just gets thrown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And my note uh, was a bit more forceful. Um, <laughs> it's like, but then... Fucking Mineta compliments her breasts and then touches them with his face because what? he's a fucking perv and a fucking assaulter. And she gets him back by literally slamming him onto the ship as he deserves. Yep. And now we're going to pause so Maria can get further details of his trash can death. <coughs> I'm going to clear my throat for this. <laughs> I was made for this. He shall only have rotten veggies for food in his trash can, with the floor of the trash can having a slippery biofilm, and he will have no shoes so that he has to stand in it. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and then next, uh, when Sue cl climbs up the ship, like after the two of them, uh, we get her present mic voiceover next, and her mm -hmm. quirk is frog, uh, meaning she can do anything a frog can. Um, and then she makes a snarky comment about it being a terrible class. And <laughs> God, I love her. She is perfect. I love how she keeps trying to break Broccoli Boy into calling her Sue and Izuku just gets so flustered. He's so cute. He's so anxious. He's like, what do you mean? That's like too informal. <laughs> it's not respectful enough. <laughs> He's so cute. Um, so yeah. Izuku, of course, is still thinking through all of this because that's what he does. It's probably also some kind of protective mechanism so that he can just deal with whatever's happening. Um, mm -hmm. But Izuku also thinks that the press break-in was a diversion caused by this League of Villains. And he thinks it's suspicious that they knew the schedule. So, like, he's catching up with the, um, the audience knows more than the characters do, but he's very, very swiftly catching up. Yep. Um, and then Mineta is all like, oh, we just have to wait for all night. Once he comes, he'll pound those guys. Uh, but Sue comes in and lays down some facts. So A, if the League of Villains have gotten this far, they're probably pretty confident that they found a way to defeat All Might because they're going for him specifically. And she also wonders if the class will be able to hold out that long. 
um, or whether they'll be able to avoid casualties. Yeah. And in the dub, it actually gets a little more dark. So after she says that they probably have something in store for All Might or they wouldn't have actually done this attack, she goes on to say that they actually need to survive not being tortured to death until All Might can get there to save them. And this sends Mineta right off the deep end as he deserves. Fuck you, Mineta. Sue is a queen. We stand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then, of course, Mineta spots some villains approaching, and then he only addresses Izuku, which is fucking rude. Because he's the worst, the Ugh. literal worst. Just for some spice, I'm going to add poison oak along with the poison ivy in Mineta's trash can. Yes, yes, please. I like it. I like it. And then, also, I feel like we need a we need at the end of the season, we need to see how far I get along with the trash can. Yes, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So then we transition to, you know, it's basically patented at this point, Izuku analysis and flashback time. So Izuku remembers all of the times All Might encouraged him, praised him, and decides, you know what? It doesn't fucking matter if the League of Villains have found a way to kill All Might or not, because these kids are going to fight and they're going to win. And like, yes, it's awful that he has to deal with that kind of stress and expectations, but also fuck yeah, be your own fucking hero. I'm here for it. Hell yeah. Um, and basically he's realizing that the villain's motivations don't matter uh, because he realizes that he, they all have to come together to defend All Might basically for everything that All Might has done throughout his whole life to defend them. Mm -hmm. um, and this whole thing just starts the entire class's heroic origin story. And it's it's just beautiful um, because it leans into the trope, but then it also flips that trope inside out. It's yes. just perfect. Yeah. yeah, you can see how determined Izuku is to protect All Might, even though he is probably scared right now. He's oh, willing yeah. to give it all for his mentor. Oh, yeah. Or dad, He's petrified. You know? <laughs> mentor dad. Yeah. <laughs> He's petrified but determined. Uh, he's just, he's so good. They're all so good. My God, we love them. Okay, so... Then we get like a bunch of like jump scenes to different parts of the arena. And so we're just going to break that down. So the first cut is to the landslide zone. And then Shoto gets his little spotlight moment number two. Yeah, he's essentially attacking everyone with his ice in that zone. Uh, basically like the same way he did in the battle training. Um, and he also is insulting villains for <laughs> failing so miserably when fighting a child. <laughs> My sassy son is the best. Yes. He just thrives off, off of sarcasm like I do. And I also love how serious he gets when he's actually has to fight villains. His mysterious third brain cell makes an appearance then vanishes when it's not needed. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. You're so right. Okay. So then we cut to the collapse zone, which is this like building that's falling apart. Kiribaku shippers, come get y'all's juice. This, this is the genesis. This is where it all began. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is the goodest juice. And listeners should know that the first time I watched this show, I was like full on Kiribaku. Uh, but now, what is it? The fourth rewatch we're on now. <laughs> uh, there are so many other ships I have, but Kiribaku was the first. So it holds a sweet yeah. little place in my heart. Also, they are fighting back to back. Mm -hmm. it's, so mm -hmm. cute. it's, you know, it's understandable. It's understandable. Mm -hmm. Like um, you can't deny it. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's content. There's, there's evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you okay there, Maria? No. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all of that junk. Like it's the, la I know it's the last day of the cold. Because it's like, I feel better and I feel good, but it's just all that junk coming yeah. back out. Yeah. Ugh. Bodies are that fucking that disgusting. Thing. <laughs> well, it's fine. I'll just like insert a little, a little goat noise and we'll <laughs> move on. So then we cut to the mountain zone. Uh, and here we have Kaminari, Jiro, and Momo are all grouped together. This time around, I finally noticed Momo gave Jiro a sword? <laughs> yeah, she Your did. Your honor, your honor. They're gay for each other. They're gay for each other. Yep, yep, yep. 
Um, it's like it's like Denki is like there, but mm-hmm. also we have these warrior lesbian warrior bisexuals just there, about to kick ass, and Denki is like their damsel He's in distress. There. Yeah, yeah. Jiro is the epitome of bisexuals with swords in this. Also, mm-hmm. if y'all are ever bored. Look up buys with swords. You won't regret it. I swear. You might end up with a little yearning. <laughs> a little. <laughs> just a little (laughs) also i finally have a sword and i'm so happy yes um so then we cut to the fire zone um i only noticed ojiro so i'm assuming he's all in his lonesome unless hagakure is around there somewhere did i miss her i feel like i missed a few people when we were going through this so like feel free to insert her if i accidentally skipped over her oh we'll get to where hagakure is don't worry about that okay (laughs) <laughs> yes poor Ojiro is all by himself he's all on his lonesome <laughs> but you know he's a very very capable person so I believe in him mm-hmm. and then we cut to the squall zone which is like this um like wintry mix kind of blizzard thing happening um we've got Tokoyami and Koda and they're like standing and they're posing and it's all very cool Tokoyami my emo bird son Mm-hmm. I love how dramatically his cape is flowing in the wind. Uh, and then we have Tenya, Shoji, Uraraka, and Mina are still by the entrance with 13. And then we see Sato and Saro are with them in a separate shot. Poor Aizawa is still in a goddamn cage match. Shiggy is just standing there with like the brain bird person who really hasn't done much yet. Uh, but basically, they've all been split up. They've all been isolated. They've all been surrounded by villains. Shit's but yeah yep also we do not see where aoyama or hagakure ended up and listeners just remember that piece of knowledge i fucking forgot about aoyama i knew i was missing someone else (laughs) my poor son i'm sorry i didn't mean to forget you (laughs) anyways to add to that each group is vastly has a vastly overpowering opponents it's at least four to one oh Oh, yeah. yeah Oh yeah, absolutely. And so then, (laughs) so all of this has been set up. Like the stakes have been made very clear. Everything's very tense. And then we cut to the fucking teacher's lounge. (laughs) And (laughs) Horikoshi does this a lot and it drives me insane. I'm not good with suspense at all. I mean, it's it's very purposeful though. It's to keep you watching. (laughs) Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I still hate him. So it helps break some of that tension too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Toshi is trying to reach 13 and Aizawa, but his calls aren't going through. And then, of course, he starts beating himself up about neglecting his teaching duties. And like, I mean, he's right, technically, but also like the crippling weight of the responsibility that his society just like heaps upon his shoulders. No reprieve, no compromise, just my poor husband. Yeah. And he's basically just berating himself for being an amateur. Like, honey, I mean, yes, you are an amateur teacher. But also, no hateful self-talk. That's not going to get you anywhere. No. He really does have a lot on his shoulders. And he hasn't yet been able to find that balance between hero and teacher. And I mean, it's only been like a few days, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it takes a while for you to find a balance between all all of that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. So Aizawa, not Aizawa, mother of God, All Might... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> thinks he's very got, different yeah <sighs> christ so all my things he's got maybe 10 minutes of his large form left and resolves to come in at the like the tail end of the lesson uh, but then he starts coughing up blood again and nezu is er- interrupts anyway and upon rewatch like nezu's behavior is indeed quite sussy he's fucking sus and i remember you watching the show after i had and you didn't find nezu suspicious at all and i was like are we watching the same show here (laughs) did you see the the rat man anyway um also his he's got like weird dialogue about himself and and, no i i just don't like him (laughs) that's it i just don't like him um, but also, can we talk about how Toshi's like adorable little squat walk to get on Nezu's level? He's so cute. Uh, he yeah, is. he also compliments Nezu's fur, and it's such a bizarre but adorable combo. Mm-hmm. Toshi is so awkward, but he's so cute. 
Um, so Nezu does his little anime introduction. So he's the principal. And then he gives All Might this lecture on responsibility and refocusing his priorities. And like, he is right. He is right. But this also does have the effect of running out the, quote unquote, you know, the supposed last few minutes of Toshi's All Might form. So, and then my brain was like, or did he accidentally give him more time to rest and recharge for the battle later? Like too many thoughts, too many theories. Yeah, no, he's he's just sus and I will not be <laughs> taking any questions about it. But he does make some very good points about Toshi needing to change his ways if he wants to be an effective teacher while slowly retiring his like hero side of his career. Mm-hmm. Um, and this definitely does tie into Toshi's need to be less proactive and stop working so much. But also it, it's very bad timing, sir, and very yes. suspicious. I don't like it. Um, Nezu has always been a little sus to me, but part of me thinks that it's just to throw off throw us off for away from the real villain yes i have seen this in a lot of animes where they have an adult that acts sus but turns out to be that there's a reason why they were acting that way and the true culprit is something someone or something else so while i am a bit sus i'm also a little skeptical of the sus so sus of the sus yes yes same same boat yeah that is that's that's how i'm feeling now but like when you first watch it He's fucking sus. I'm not gonna lie. But now I am also sus of the sus because there's no easy answer. And I hate Horikoshi for Yeah, I was just so about well. to be like, well, thank you, Horikoshi. We fucking hate you. <laughs> we hate you for writing it so well. Damn it. <laughs> yep. So then Nezu pours tea and he's like, Oh, don't bother going to USJ when you just have to rush back. Just stay here and listen to me talk. And again, sussy. But Toshi also mentions that this is pretty typical of Nezu and he just fucking likes to talk. So maybe he has just some elaborate red herring and just... (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so the lecture itself is about how uh, Toshi did hero work at the expense of his teaching work. And then he just goes off on on a Nezu tangent. um, And like the bop music is playing in the background again. And like, is the bop music hinting at the fact that everything is okay now, right in this moment, but watch out later. Mm -hmm. Um, Seems to be, seems to be the running thing. Um, Why is Nezu delaying All Might? Uh, Put a pin right in there along with the sus and sus of the sus Mm -hmm. conversation. Cause it, yeah, we've covered it. I'm also in the dub. (laughs) his line um it, he's basically gonna start a tangent lecture about combat pedagogy as viewed through the lens of ethical quirk use mm. sir sir mm. sir now, now is not the time yeah i like that throughout this entire combo small might was still doing the waddle squat he's yeah. so re- respectful and adorable oh god i love him so much um but even so, like, even as all of this is happening, Toshi's only kind of half listening to Nezu because mm-hmm. he's still thinking about his calls not going through. And so, like, there's, like, definitely a heck of concern brewing in that little brain of his. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think Aizawa needs to give him lessons on danger senses, um, mm-hmm. like I mentioned last episode. But also, <coughs> <coughs> we'll get to it. Yeah, put a pin in the term danger sense. <laughs> yeah. For a long way away. Okay, so then we cut back to USJ. Shoji is doing some recon, and he confirms that although everyone is scattered, they're still in the building. What this means for Aoyama and Hagakure, I got no clue. So but They're around. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Whatever. Um, so 13 instructs Tenya uh, slash Ida to run for help and confirms that none of the sensors or cell phones are working. Then she mentions that all this tech that they've got works via infrared rays. So there's a high likelihood that someone with an interference quirk is hiding somewhere and blocking them somehow. So they've got no way to call for help unless someone manages to leave. And I did not have time this week to Google the infrared rays thing. Um, So I have absolutely no clue whether that has any basis in reality or not. Yeah, and the infrared rays are not even mentioned in the dub. Um, but also when I got to this part in the outline, I also did not Google because I <laughs> I do not understand rays and shit like that. It, it, and if I Google it now, it's just going to prove 
that I will never know about Ray's and shit. And then I will be mad. Um, don't email me about it, but do wait, wait, do email us about it. And then Nicole, you just pass those emails on to me. Cause I want to know. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to put that in the not for Nicole unless she wants to get angry <laughs> folder. Perfect. And then my next note was like, how does Kaminari's electrification type quirk even relate to infrareds? But we already got a wonderful explanation of that from Maria. So thank you. Uh, also, at this point, it would be really hard for Denki to set up, have time to set up a signal because of everything that's going on around him. Um, and it would require a lot of concentration that he does not have right now. Yeah, even if yeah. he was good at concentrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then, of course, my sweet son, Tanya, is all, I cannot abandon my friends. That is the height of dishonor. But everyone's all like, no, please just listen to the teacher. And then 13 repeats her, like, use your quirk to save people lesson. Oh, mm-hmm. she's so good. I love how they call him emergency exit. It's so funny. That is it's really so cute. cute. It is cute. And then Erotica is like, don't worry, boo-boo. We got your back. Like, we'll hold down the fort here. You just, you play your part and we'll play ours. Like, I just, I love our children. How are they so good? I know they're fictional, but also how are they so good? They're, they are the goodest. And they all, they're all so encouraging of each other. It is, it's just perfection. Yeah. They all believe in him. Like the good BBs they that they are. And then Kurogiri interrupts. He's like, bitch, I am right here. And 13's like, well, it don't matter. It don't matter. And then I thought we were going to get like the cur- the 13 Kurogiri show- showdown. And I was like, yes, let's go. I'm so ready for this. And then we got a goddamn cut scene. I was so fucking mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a- We'll get it. We'll get it very soon. It's okay. Yeah. Impatience. The third thing was like, bitch, them fighting words. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, can we just like, can we just have thirst break number five? Because... I don't know what it is exactly about 13. Like she just, she's so wise and she's so kind. And like her voice actor has like a really nice voice. And then like, she's also super strong and awesome. And she has this really powerful quirk. And I just, oh my God, I would marry her today. I would marry her right now. I'm so in love with her. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So, so in case anyone is unclear, Bud goes for all the nice <laughs> characters that you can bring home to your parents. Uh, and Maria but and I still kick some ass. Yes, yes, that too. Uh, but nice, I think, is the yeah. operative word. And Maria and I uh, don't. It's like, yeah, no. No, they... I like the threatening. Yeah, yeah, give us, give us the threatening. This is fiction. We need it for. Yeah, our exactly. <laughs> it's fictional. <laughs> <laughs> Now Sometimes I want your favorite is a serial push. killer and it's just, it's, that's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Don't question yeah. it. Just enjoy. <laughs> Plus they usually tend to be hotter anyways. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> perhaps, anyway. Perhaps we should get back to point 41 in the outline. <laughs> <laughs> they just look, all of these episodes are just really done. So it's just how it's going to be. So cut scene back to the shipwreck zone. Minetta is the only one acting like a normal kid, but we hate him. So it's just annoying and we're not going to give him a pass. Meanwhile, (laughs) Sue and Midoriya are like using their brains and they're theorizing and they're realizing that although the League of Villains clearly had info about the USJ arena itself, they don't know shit about the kids. Again, either their source wasn't actually all that knowledgeable about this class or they're fucking with the villains or, or their source gave away info without meaning to like... And if Shiggy just happened to overhear someone's side convo, something like that. Yeah, there's also the Fortnite Buddies fan theory that yes. I love on TikTok. <laughs> I love that one. I love it too. Um, well, also, not much has been known about the class at this point, so it makes sense that they wouldn't know anything about their strengths. Also, adults tend to underestimate and or demean children so mm-hmm. that their own arrogance at them is what makes them, well, careless. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I do think it definitely decreases the likelihood of one of the kids themselves being the traitor, because at this point, the kids at least know each other's quirks generally. And like, Mm -hmm. you don't need to be super knowledgeable to know that you don't put Sue in the shipwreck zone. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But that's also me just not wanting it to be one of the kids. I just. Oh, yeah. We'll get to We'll we'll get there when we get there. (laughs) Yeah. So then, you know, you have sweet Izuku 
being all anxious about getting Sue's nickname right. And just like, you know, this boy is a pronoun respecter. Like he just, he has that vibe. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh for yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, also at this point, <laughs> uh, my note was Manetta's being a bitch while Izuku and Sue strategize. So yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> And then I kind of dove into it because Mineta has this line in the dub and he says, the best chance is to wait for a pro hero. Mm -hmm. And like, this is the way of the old guard of the pro heroes. And this is the reason that heroes have become less effective at their jobs. Everyone has to step up to the plate these days and make the big sacrifices to save people and make society better. The fact that this opinion is held by Mineta, as in the opinion is just to wait for whoever's best suited. Yep. Is probably actually on purpose, seeing as how Mineta is the worst. So you want to align the worst viewpoint with the worst person. Yes. Um, Like, and if you like read into it enough, you realize that this old way of doing it is also the worst way of doing it. And we need to- Oh my God, you fucking said it. Thank you. Not like he's gonna bite them in the ass or anything, you know? No, no, yeah. no, no, not at all. Not at all. Mm-hmm. Mm. Also, yes, Minetta, shaken fear. You will know <laughs> real fear when I finish with you and perfect your trash can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So then Sue and Izuku, while they're strategizing, Sue goes into more detail about her quirk because, you know, they're going to need that info to get the fuck out of there. So she can jump really high. She can stick to walls. She can stick her tongue about 20 meters. And I looked that up. That's a little over 65 and a half feet for us gross ass Americans who are still using the non-metric system. She can also regurgitate her stomach and wash it. And then she can secrete this mucus, but it doesn't do much except sting you. I'm sorry. 65 and a half feet? I know! <laughs> that is so many. Because, well, like, what? I thought 20 meters. I thought like a meter was a yard. And I don't know. I can't do math. And it still works. But I, uh, it's so long. It's so goddamn long. That's like three buses. Yes. Well, maybe two buses. Whatever. It's it's long. It's very long. I I cannot. Uh, it hurts my brain. Yep. And then of course, Benetta still manages to find something to be gross about because that's who he is. And meanwhile, Izuku is just like, oh my god, you're so strong. You're so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Him. Yep. Izuku is the worst. But also, we need to pause. You mean Benetta? No. You said Izuku is the worst. Yeah. I'm sorry. Izuku is the best. <laughs> Manetta is the worst. Manetta yes. is the worst. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh, I have too many feelings, but also we just need to pause to gag over Manetta's mucus comment. What? Ugh, I hate him. Yeah. What? It's uh, time to add another thing to Manetta's great, I mean, trash can. Uh, this time it is a slightly wet, moldy blanket. Tune in oh, next God. time to see what happens to be added next. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nicole, every time you cackle like that, it cracks me up. Okay. So Izuku then goes on to describe his own quirk and he's like, eh, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Cause like right now I can only use it once or twice. Um, and then Mineta reveals that he can like pop the little balls of it that are on his head. He can like pop those off and they'll stick to anything but himself. Um, but then if he pulls off too many, like he can just keep pulling them off and they'll just regenerate. But if he does that too many times, he does start bleeding. So Poor Sue. She's got to ha- carry the whole group project on her back, basically. <laughs> As her partners are Sue's probably, Yeah, Sue's probably like, why me? Yep. <laughs> also, there's this moment where Minetta is like, I know it's not a good quirk. And there are like little fish cakes in the background. Um, and then, of course, Izuku and Sue's just twin blank faces are killing me. <laughs> just yeah. judging him. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, they are judging your quirk, Mineta, because you suck. Yeah, feel bad about it. (laughs) Um, Also, my next note is, what do you mean fish cakes? And in case listeners don't know, I am not very familiar with uh, Japanese cuisine because I grew up as a picky eater. So I, (laughs) I, I didn't know those cute little white and pink flower things are fish cakes. Yeah, so they're just like 
cooked down gelatinized fish matter, whatever. They're delicious Ew. is all you need to know. No, they're really, really yes, good. Yes, they are delicious. They're so good. And like, I tried to Google like fish cake symbolism. Um, I, I, I got nothing. Maria, do you have anything? Um, so, uh, fish cakes, I guess it's just very traditional. It just kind of adds a little bit of funny aspect to it. There's really not that much symbolism for it. Okay, so it's just like this is like a lighthearted joking moment. Yeah. Okay, pretty much. Okay. That's still that's still more information than I have. So thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Also, Manetta deserves to be judged. <laughs> oh god. Oh man. Manetta's babe. trying to kill me. I swear. <laughs> he will not succeed. He's not that great. Yep. So basically, like all the strategizing is happening. They're all comparing info, but our babies are out of time. One villain makes this giant water hand thing. I guess that's their quirk, and they slice the boat in half. Yeah, basically that they're talk they're talking too long, and the villains got bored, and then they yeah. just like, no, we're gonna sink it. Yep, they're like, we don't give a fuck that we don't know your quirks. We're just gonna start this because this is taking too long. Honestly, the fact that they even let them have a discussion is pretty surprising. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the kids definitely mention that, and that's what clues them in to the fact that the villains don't know what their capabilities are. Yeah. Um, so Mineta, of course, flips out and just starts randomly throwing balls at the villains, which does nothing. Uh, but the villains don't the villains don't know what the balls are. And you can see one of them like they're like, ew, what is this? Um, which gives Isugu this little light bulb moment. Yeah, and essentially what happens is he quotes All Might because of course he does. Um, and he comes up with a plan to beat the villains using their own overconfidence against them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta say, the villain who was using the water to slowly push them away was kind <laughs> of adorable in like the, if you weren't here to kill these kids, I'd probably be okay watching you play in water. <laughs> Yeah, there's something, you can definitely tell that not all of these villains have the same convictions, Mm because some of them are way less invested than others. And then, of course, you have Mineta freaking out some more, being really gross about Momo. Sir, leave my sweet, shy, lesbian alone. She doesn't deserve your grossness. She she really doesn't. And he's essentially crying like a baby. And, like, even Izuku doesn't cry in a crisis. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's probably going to be tears in his eyes, but he's not bawling. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the panic is well-founded. Technically, but he sucks. So, like, we're ignoring it. He sucks. So he should not be panicking. Bemoaning the fact that you don't get, what, interaction with Momo's breasts is not Mm -hmm. well-founded or appropriate or anything. So we're going to pause again to gag. I am going to add the smallest air filter to provide just enough air so that banana doesn't die quickly. But the worst part is that there will be a water system that slowly, very slowly starts to fill up the trash can. (laughs) God, I don't know. I didn't know this is what my engineering background would help me with, but here we are. We're grateful for it. (laughs) Yes, we are. Yep. And so, you know, the villains can hear Mineta screaming and they're like, these kids are total wimps. Um, But then one of them is like, no, no. Remember what Shiggy said? He said, don't underestimate them and to take their quirks into account more than their ages, which like, I guess makes sense if you're a villain and your goal is to kill a bunch of teenagers, but bad advice for daily life. Pay attention to people's ages. Yes. Yes. Do that. Um, also, Bud mentioned it a lot earlier than I did, but this is the point where I gave up calling him hand guy and just started calling him Shiggy. Yeah. Also, my note was they really should have watched a uh, teenager's TikTok. Yeah, apparently they have been. <laughs> <laughs> or at least Shiggy is. Yeah. And then Izuku, he just, he starts imitating Katsuki. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say here. I don't even know what to say. It's just so fucking funny. Yeah, yeah. He's it, my my note is in all caps. Um, and it is <laughs> is Zuku fucking copying Kachan word for word, shouting and screaming, die. These oh, children God. are exhausting. <laughs> yep. <sighs> These two mirror each other so much, and yet they can't fucking see it. God damn it. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then somehow this inspires Mineta to have like a buy crisis in the midst of his we're all gonna die crisis. So yeah, he's, that's what's going on with him. Yeah, but also he's too gross to deserve a buy crisis. (laughs) 
Mineta deserves even less. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. And then so Izuku, like finally they just start fighting. And Izuku does like that finger flick thing that we saw earlier with the um like the ball throwing. And so he does it this time to like quote unquote smash the water and create this giant whirlpool with the force of that. And that traps the villains while also obscuring their vision. And so Sue has Mineta under one arm again, and she uses her tongue to grab Izuku as she leaps away. And <sighs> Izuku's fingers are flapping again. And I just, we just need to get to the stain arc already because this needs to stop happening as much. <laughs> I'm so ready <laughs> for this to not happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes uh yeah the the flapping fingers are gross um but also this is like Deku's first time using an actual planned attack Good point. um basically a Delaware smash out of two fingers and he does break those fingers but he doesn't break his arm so mm-hmm. he's doing yeah, better it was it was an inspired moment for Izuku but I agree I would like for it if my boy would stop hurting himself please That'd be nice <laughs> yeah And then Mineta is inspired by Izuku and he starts throwing a fuckload of balls at the villain whirlpool so they'll all be stuck together and to help prevent them from pursuing. Yeah, yeah. And again, Mineta still sucks. He's Uh never going to not suck. Um, But I'm pretty sure that Izuku's natural quirk was inspiration. That's a good ass point. (laughs) So um, if if Izuku was a and d character, he would be a bard. And if you know, you know. I do not know, but I trust you. Same, same. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And then, oh god, oh god, that would be that would be a lot of explanation. And let's just say his inspiration inspiration is an attack of a bard, and notorious for uh, attracting everyone. (laughs) Uh, I know that part. (laughs) Well, I didn't know any of that, so that's interesting. Um, so as they're, you know, sailing away from all the villains, Sue makes a comment, like, I guess it's like we cleared the first hurdle and she ain't wrong. Cause there's going to be more fuckery afoot. Brace yourselves, y'all just brace yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Sue is so level-headed and sassy. Like I love her so much. Mm-hmm. All the fuckery. All the fuckery. <laughs> Also, she knows how to give credit where it's due, even with Mineta, although he doesn't deserve it. He does not. Uh, he gets no credit. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, we get the end credits. So we're wrapping yeah, up the episode. We're almost there. And Nicole has even more notes about the end credits when we don't <laughs> even need them. Um, I yes, wanna... we do. yes, we do. Uh, yes, we I, do. Yes, we do. No, under... no self-shaming. No self-shaming. If okay. all my's not allowed to do it, you're not allowed to do it. Okay. That's... <laughs> That's inspirational, I guess. Um, I, I like. I don't understand this next part because Principal Nezu, at least his English voice actor, he voices. He also voices Kyo from Fruits Basket, and I, I, I don't understand because <laughs> I do not hear Nezu when I listen to Kyo. That is baffling. It's baffling. I, I don't understand. Uh, it's, it's discombobulating. Is what it is. Anyway. Um, also, Aizawa actually has a different voice actor in season one than in the following seasons, which is the actual reason his voice isn't so growly and deep as I remember from my last rewatch. Interesting. Huh. Of course you watched. Oh, God. You <laughs> 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 ah. um, My voice started to go away for a second there. Um, of course you watched the names. I... I figured you would. Um, I just skipped this because it was too late at night. So I didn't skip the intro, but I did skip the, the, the end credits. credits. Yeah, we're yeah. very lucky that Nicole is doing it because well, Maria well, and ever, I definitely would not. <laughs> ever since Hitchcock a doodle, I feel like I have to. <laughs> well, look at all the information you've uncovered. So <laughs> It's obviously valuable and we love you and we thank you. So then we get the preview and Ochako voices them this time around. There's more fighting and dashing around, more me having brain discombobulation and like everybody's defending themselves and Tenya's getting help and Ochako makes this weird ass comment about an explosion in Momo's physical development. What the fuck, Ochako? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Basically, I, I I love the part where Denki is just panicking and Momo is being the badass mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as she deserves. Um, hand guy or 
Shiggy runs <laughs> at Aizawa and he's wearing red shoes, people. Oh, remember that. Um, and then the dub of Ochako's line is we're going to see some unexpected developments from Yaoi Rose's body. <laughs> God damn it, Shonen. Uh, why? <laughs> it just is what it is. And yeah. Sai, we're, we are in for an even bigger roller coaster. Oh God. Yes, we are. It's only going to get more intense from here, folks. But anyway, that's the episode. We're going to move into manga differences. Take it away, Nicole. Yes. So the first thing I noticed is that Shiggy did actually have lines this episode, and I'm assuming they're the ones that were from chapter 13 that I mentioned last episode. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I I didn't check because it it doesn't affect the plot. So let's keep going. (laughs) Um... There's honestly not that much manga differences in this one. In chapter 14, um, it's actually not a difference, but it is a similarity that I wanted to point out. And that is that split second scene of Kurigiri being surprised by Aizawa's fighting is here too. Mm. Um, And also Kurigiri like more obviously threatens All Might. But again, it doesn't actually change anything. And then chapter 15 just had the usual dialogue translation differences. No other changes. Okay. So then we're going to hop right into the Easter eggs and fandom theory roundup section, which has a lot more material than in previous episodes. So <laughs> We're ready. We're ready for it. Give it to us. <clears throat> All right, so I just mentioned it, the red shoes that Shigaraki is wearing. Mm -hmm. Um, These red shoes are pretty much very close, if not identical, to the pair that Izuku wears. Mm -hmm. Um, We haven't really decided when we're going to discuss the red shoes theory, but we are because it does tie Izuku and Shigaraki pretty close together. Um, But just remember that they're both wearing pretty similar red shoes. Yeah, the color red itself also has like, you know, color theory implications. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then my next point is basically, is there a UA trader or isn't there? So in the manga, it's laid out pretty well as opposed to in the anime. And it it says the simplest explanation is that they caused that media rush the other day in order to get in and gather intel. Mm -hmm. So I think this is where people think there might not even be a traitor um, among a bunch of other factors that we've already gotten into, such as the traitor not giving them very good intel. Yeah. And on the other hand, you could say that the press was let in so that whoever was on the inside wasn't being watched when they got the schedule for USJ. Um, Yeah, it's really up in the air. Yeah, it is really up in the air. You can't really make a good determination Mm -hmm. from this or really from anything at this point but (laughs) we are going to discuss it further yeah um, at the end of the season um I also did want to point out that maybe it was just a schedule for USJ itself that had All Might and 13 written in Mm. but then the hero class for that specific day hadn't been filled in yet this gives the writing the benefit of the doubt for a lot of the holes that we pointed out earlier yeah. as well as it being the earliest arc in the series. Um, so basically they just don't have that much to play with and um, as far as characters and plot go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it it doesn't erase the fact that there's a lot of holes in this episode and the traitor theory in general, just yeah. in this episode. But we'll get to it even more later. <laughs> also, my last section is basically... The suspects of the UA trader, if there is one. And again, we're going to go into this a lot more. So this is just like a preview for listeners to keep listening to the end of this season. So the first two suspects I want to point out are Aoyama and Tagakure. At this point, it is mainly because their locations are not known following Kurogiri's warping. And that gives them a lot of leeway for doing stuff that we just don't know about and we still don't know about. They could have done anything while they were all separated. And then my next one is that Nezu can be seen as keeping All Might from USJ, which we already discussed. Plus, I don't like him, so I want (laughs) him to be the traitor. Um, Because it won't cost you as much emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. And then the next suspect is actually Denki. The, The suspicions around him actually include evidence from later chapters and arcs, but he's there. And if you take into account how he was supposed to try and help with the signals, 
Mm-hmm. He might have been able to do it, but didn't on purpose. It's there. It's a theory. Or but maybe also- he was the one like dampening the signal. Well, I say even as I'm like absolutely adamant that Dinky is not the UA trader and would never do something like that because he is my good boy. Yeah, but also, <laughs> and and this is this is a spoiler. Um, there they find the villain who's knocking out the signals and. Oh, okay. Like, I didn't remember that part. <laughs> yeah. There's one there. So okay, he's cool. not specifically blocking the signals. Okay, good. My boy is um, safe for now. Yeah. And then other suspects. Um, I personally think we can add some teachers to this list, but the reasons for that are going to come again in the next few episodes. So I'm not going to say them here, but we are going to do a full roundup at the end of the season. And I think yes. this is going to include a suspect <laughs> list and it's going to include like all of the spoilers. So if listeners have been waiting for us to get into the spoilers, we are just keep listening. Far away to it. Yeah. We're trying to find a balance between being spoilery and not being too spoilery. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, it, it's a hard balance because there's a lot of material. <laughs> There is. There's so much. And everything, everything connects to everything else. It's mm-hmm. ridiculous. Well, that's all I have. Yeah. I don't think I have any further comments. Maria? Tune in next week to see how ri- ridiculous Trashta, that's what I'm going to call her now, Trashta. <laughs> Where are you at? Trashnetta. Trashnetta. Sure. It works. <laughs> um, also, I feel... We're going to have a dog, and I feel like this is something that should go at the end of the season in our uh, website. Yes. We'll have like a, we can have like a trash net, a grave description that we just keep adding to. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I like this. I like this a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been My Hero Analysis. You'll hear us next week. And in the meantime, go beyond Plus Ultra and thirst responsibly. Bye, y'all. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with us, have questions you'd like us to discuss on air, give topic suggestions for bonus episodes, or submit fan art for us to display, visit our website at myheroanalysis.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Just search for at myheroanalysis. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review.